Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you. So as we are turning to our scripture lesson for this morning, would you please pray with me? Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Still any voice within us but your own. Help us to remember what it is to shine your light into this world, to remember what it is to be your loved ones who are meant to move and live and breathe and to change this world and to be your kingdom come in this world, not just the next. And now may the words of our mouths and the thoughts and meditations of our hearts be found acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our scripture lesson for this day comes to us in our sermon series on Galatians 5.22. Now listen for God's word to us this day. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the most beloved musicals in recent years has to be Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton. Like Jesus Christ Superstar, the story is narrated by the supposed villain of the tale, in this case, Aaron Burr. A quiet hero of the American Revolution and our third vice president, Burr was the grandson of the famous Puritan preacher of the fire and brimstone revivals, Jonathan Edwards. He has a couple of particularly impressive solos throughout the play. However, the one that epitomizes his method of living is called Wait For It. Always afraid to bet on the wrong horse or to speak too loudly for what might be seen as the wrong cause or to stand up at the wrong moment as he sings in that song, I'm willing to wait for it. And as history has shown us, he waited too long, and he picked the exact wrong moment. Patience, it is our word for the day. We have looked at joy, that gift of grace from God, and peace, the wholeness of self for which we are all created, and that we are meant to seek for one another. So now a bit of a switch to what has often been touted as the ultimate virtue, especially when we're talking to children, it seems. I remember when Brad came home one night from being over at a friend's house when we were in the early years of our marriage. They had actually been visiting this friend's parents' house that evening, and whatever they had been discussing, his friend had been very frustrated with his mother's timing on some particular issue, because before this conversation was over, the young man, who was well over six foot, turned to her and said, Mother, I am a man, and I want it now, while stamping his foot. She was not amused. And we had a new saying in our house from then on. It was, man, man. He still doesn't know. Patience, it is a concept we all attempt to instill within our children to varying degrees of success, teaching them to wait, to not need everything now, now, to wait for then. Because though we are teaching them with little things like toys and tablets and television shows now, there will be much larger things in life for which they one day will have to wait. As grown-ups, we all know this to be the case. We've experienced the hard part of waiting, when it's not an answer we're looking forward to and we have to prepare ourselves for the worst. Or perhaps we are hoping for a new job, but afraid to let ourselves get our hopes up. Life is, in many ways, an endless cycle of waiting for good things and challenging things. A certain amount of patience is really just a fact of life. Biblically, the Greek word means long-suffering, forbearance, endurance, steadfastness. Having a really long temper would be an almost literal translation of the word. 
And we see the perfect example of what this looks like in God's own self. For we know our God is slow to anger and with a steadfast love that endures forever. Because you see, the patience is always for a purpose. And no, it's not so you can be entertained by your iPad, no matter what my five-year-olds may try to tell you. Our patience, our endurance, our steadfastness, even our long-suffering is always out of love for another. In God's case, it is all of us. And in our case, it is one another. This morning, we elected our new officers and committee members which means that in the next few weeks, I will be training our ruling elders and deacons on our theology, history, and polity before they are ordained, installed, and begin their work in August. This will include, among other things, a crash course through our Book of Confessions, those documents that we use for our affirmation of faith every Sunday. Believe it or not, our officers actually all study them before they can begin their terms of office. They learn a bit about where these documents come from, who wrote them, and the time in which they were written. So the first of these confessions to be written on our shores was the Confession of 1967. It was written by the Presbyterian Church in the United States, which was actually the southern branch of the Presbyterian Church, something I always found remarkable. In the midst of all the social movements of the 1960s, the church found its voice, listened to the Holy Spirit speaking through the scriptures, and said, here is what we hear God saying in our day. Within its witness, it reads, in each time and place, there are particular problems and crises through which God calls the church to act. The church, guided by the Spirit, humbled by its own complicity, and instructed by all attainable knowledge, seeks to discern the will of God and learn how to obey in these concrete situations. You see, there are times when patience simply will not do, when God's judgment and justice does actually show up, those times when people are getting hurt beyond disrepair, and to say, just wait a little longer, is actually an atrocity and an abomination in and of itself. One of which the church has certainly been complicit over these years and centuries. Nevertheless, the church and God's people have also been a part of the solution. In the time when the C-67, that confession was written, members of the Presbyterian Church were also marching with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement, for example. The most famous of these Presbyterians was the stated clerk of the Northern Presbyterian Church, the Reverend Eugene Carson Blake, who turns out was fellow St. Louisan. God created us in the image of the Trinity, to love and be loved, not forcing our own wills upon one another and being slow to anger, ready to endure whatever comes. However, God also created us to have full lives as fearfully and wonderfully made people who are able to follow our own God-given consciousness with full and equal rights working together to ensure God's equity and justice for all of God's children. Our long-suffering does not apply when subjugation, oppression, and tyranny are involved. As we heard again from Exodus in our first reading this morning, when God came down in the burning bush, that is when God chooses to act. A well-known parable in the modern day comes through preachers both far and near. I raged and I prayed to God when I saw this problem or that one. I cried and I screamed, why don't you do something about it? And God finally responded, I did do something. I sent you. 
in the Hebrew. The word that we often see translated as steadfast love can also be translated this way, tenacious solidarity. Patience is well and good and even necessary throughout our lives, but it turns from virtue to vice when it becomes a mechanism through which we can choose willful ignorance of God's children around us being harmed. In those times, God's tenacious solidarity, endurance, and steadfast willingness to suffer by standing with those who need us is what is needed. The question is, will we answer the call like Moses did, and Esther, like Martin, and Elizabeth, and John, and Susan, and Harvey, and Rosa, and Sojourner, and Marcia, and Harriet, and Sylvia, and Thurgood, and Lucy, and Ruth, and George, and Nelson, and Abby, and Lou, and Ruby, and so many others who have gone before us and so many others who are still going. That favorite virtue, it only works if what we're waiting for isn't something God already created us to have. So practice patience when you know you should. And practice tenacious solidarity for all those times in this world when God wouldn't want us to wait for it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.